I was an art major in university. And one of the thing, one of the life lessons I took from that was always have two canvases going. You have this one creative problem that in your, you just grind down on it and you're frustrated rather than just walk away and not be productive, mm. take the canvas, turn it against the wall so you're not looking at it, yeah. flip the other one around yeah. and work on this other thing. Today I'm chatting with Nathan Moody, who works as a musician, sound designer, mastering engineer, and sound recordist. Coming from a visual arts background, Nathan applies a rare artistic insight into his sound work, which has led him to explore some innovative and ambitious high-concept personal music projects. Such projects have involved building an ensemble of DIY electroacoustic instruments, as well as reamping an album through three real physical stereo plate reverbs. Nathan seems to always be on the hunt, not just for new sounds, but also new ways of creating. His process and approach are fascinating to hear about, and in this chat we delve into some of the ideas behind his two releases from last year, A Vast Unwelcome and Super Temporal. Is your studio at home or is it a different space? Yeah, yeah, I work out of my home. The lack of friction around just going to a place, turning the power on and just starting and being productive really quickly, mm. that always wins out for me. This is actually the room intended as the dining room oh, okay. in a 1955 house. In America, you know, the post-war building era, the rooms are very, very small, all arranged off like a long corridor. So like the, the how space is apportioned in these kind of mid-50s homes is pretty bad. Uh, so you got to kind of just pick the room that looks like it will be the most forgiving and kind of just try to make it work as best as you can. What I've found over the years is that I really need to be kind of on top of the thing that I'm working with, you know? So I, I don't like the idea of like, I'll have some bits here and then the other side of the room, I'll have a stack of keyboards or something. I kind of need mm -hmm. everything just contained to just a desk, basically. How do you work with that stuff? I don't have the cognitive bandwidth to manage like multiple stations during like one jam. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so the way my room's set up is where I'm sitting right now is my mastering desk and my editing desk. So this is like, like my, my a position. Yeah. And then immediately to my left, I've got my primary synthesizers and outboard processing gear underneath them. That's like my B station. And then behind me, I'm going to fill that with a few, my is kind of right behind me is like my C position. Right. So back there, I'm going to have like single instruments that I might solo on, on top of uh, some other live performance as an overdub. I also like having each station be format specific. Hmm. So behind me, I've got a, a whole bunch of uh, Seat Lombard wooden instruments hmm. that I'll put that I have put together in like one station. Yeah. Um, even with its own little dedicated mixer. Uh, so, um, so I tend to do it more in terms of uh, stations per instrument. Having a studio B that I would go to just specifically to record, whether it's props for sound design or instruments, um, stuff like that, that I definitely have considered. And I've looked at, at pricing uh, for that kind of stuff. Um, but I think that for how often I'd use it, it would be a poor investment and rent is always just a, feels like throwing money away a little bit for now. I've made it work. And like all the sound libraries that I do, I record in this room. When I do pull out those instruments, I set them up in here and I record in this room. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have to kind of be very careful about like today I'm going to record this snare drum, <laughs> <laughs> set it up, mic it, record it. And then, okay, now I have to put the snare drum away and now I have to. Yeah. Do a pass on the djembe or the cello or whatever, um, and that 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 adds a lot of friction. But um, since a lot of my work tends to be um, electronic, uh, that tends to be an acceptable friction compared to having my electronic instruments and primary studio in in a different house or a different mm. building. I think it's it's a bit of a battle between you know having something that's just pristine for just just for listening versus what's good enough to also have like an inspiring space where you've got stuff around you know that you can you can use um because often i find like you know working in games um you you're the, the sounds that you're designing are, are laid with so many things that if you've got a bit of a dirty recording it often doesn't really matter because you know you, you you're just chucking it in there it's all about the character the sound we did a placeholder test for the sound of just mantling over some railings 
And I just got my uh, iPhone out and I was just down the street. It was just like slapping railings, slapping bricks and that sort of thing. And we just kept it in the game. It just sounded fine. It was good. I love, love, love stories like that. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, there's background noise and it's like yeah. crazy, like compressed, expanded. And uh, yeah. But if it, if, the, if it fits and, you know, to your point, like every mix is like intense and layered and dense and yeah. like just, you know, a sometimes a 48 decibel noise floor just doesn't matter yeah, <laughs> or a 36 yeah. you know decibel noise floor just doesn't matter yeah. uh, in the context of a, of a larger mix for sure so yeah we're gonna talk a little bit about um your two well two of you you released two eps or albums last year right uh yeah two full length so yeah i've been, I played super temporal uh about two or three times first of all i found it to be super cinematic it, it just felt like a soundtrack to a film that just kind of doesn't exist or something G gave me very much neuromancer system shock vibes and when the electronic drums kicked in it seemed like there was a bit of a kind of a late 90s early thousands almost influence in there i'm glad that uh, that you feel that way about the about the album um i guess my my question would be what and this is a hard one for anyone to answer me especially but like what makes music cinematic I think it's possibly the, the 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 structure of the arrangements. So that there's a lot of kind of storytelling and, and narrative in the way that the tracks are arranged. It seems to allow more space than say a John Hopkins electronic album or even an Aphex Twin or something where there is like there's less time to kind of set a scene, if you know what I mean. Whereas I felt like in this, there's a lot of kind of landscaping and kind of establishing. Mm you know moods and textures before you, you're taking along paths and that sort of thing yeah that that, that resonates with me um and yeah I, I think that on this album certainly there was more percussion than i typically have mm. in a lot of my work and that's partially because of my relationship to to rhythm like if i start with drums all of my uh composition crutches come out of the come out of the closet and i start just yeah. doing the same thing over and over again for me composing with drums first imposes a structure on everything yeah yeah and uh, it perhaps i'm just not a good enough drum programmer that i don't feel like okay after 16 bars this has got to go to something else mm. and so you know then i start building in like build-ups and breakdowns and it becomes a lot more structured but yeah i, I think that one of the things that was different about super temporal is that the foundation of every track is a partially self playing patch mm, okay. um, that I'm interceding with, but I'm often performing this patch using like four attenuator knobs. And that's how I'm info. That's how I'm performing the patch. And then after that's done, this is true of most of the tracks, not all of them, but most of the tracks, then I will actually sit at a keyboard and I, and, uh, for that album, I soloed over everything without MIDI. Okay, nice. Yeah. So I just performed live on top, you know, doing however many passes or punch-ins that it took to kind of get a performance that I liked. Mm. Um, so I think that that's why some of the tracks are are loose and there's a lot of pregnant pauses and negative space. And then it's interesting that you mentioned the era of the drums because guess when I started making electronic music um, in the late '90s and early oh, 2000s. Okay, right. so, um, <laughs> you know, so a lot of my a lot of my musical influences, um, even though I would not classify my work in this genre, but a lot of my influences are directly out of uh, the industrial music scene. I'm a big, big fan of just distorting the crap out of drums. Yeah. Um, uh, having them be sparse and heavy when they do land. So, so yeah, I, I wonder if that's also kind of the, the era that you're hearing. It's got a freshness about it. I was, I was talking to my friend and um, when we went to Superbooth, I met my, old, my buddy that I went to university with and uh, he said that his daughter, all she listens to is all the music that he listened to when she was his age. <laughs> and he's <laughs> trying to figure out whether that was just a cool era, like an actual cool era of music, or whether it's just she likes her dad sort of thing. <laughs> ah, I'll never forget when I was a, when I was a kid, there was a weekly news magazine that always had like a back, a lot of magazines do this, like a back page editorial, like a guest editorial page. Hmm. Um, 
And I'll never forget, one of them was actually written by the director, John Waters. Oh, okay. Right. And it was all about how he didn't feel like uh, kids were rebelling enough anymore. Yeah. Right. And he had this whole, he wrote this whole, like, very satirical screed about how, like, why would you listen to music that your parents liked? <laughs> your, your, your parents liked Black Sabbath. You need to listen to like the quietest, eeriest, weirdest shit. And you, your job is to freak your parents out. What the hell are you doing? But uh, great music is evergreen. And, you know, yeah. the late, you know, the 90s was just a, an amazing era for for music. And I think yeah, that it, it was yeah, incredible. I would almost argue the 90s had better mainstream music than the 80s did. Um, the eighties had amazing music, but I think all of the most formative influential stuff was not happening in the mainstream. Uh, I think the nineties started to, to, to diversify a lot. Um, but it's interesting now that like, everything is so narrow cast na with kind of the general death of radio. Mm. Um, it's, it's rare for an act or an album to like, uh, become like a cultural reference point. Mm. Like, you know, I mean a little bit before my time, but like, you know, the, the Eagles in the 80s or, the, or in the 70s, everyone knew the Eagles and everyone knew Hotel California and songs like that. Yeah. And these days, you know, most people can't live their lives without knowing some Taylor Swift just through, you know, exposure to media of any kind. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are there are fewer opportunities. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, um, but it's interesting that there's fewer opportunities for like these kind of common cultural touchstones. Um, that you that I mean now you still get in film, yeah, um, or or television shows, but I think that's happening a little less in in the era of music. Yeah, it's interesting that one. I mean, the whole, everyone's relationship with music has just massively changed. I mean, first of all, music's been just devalued. It's, it, it, music has no value in in a in a general sense, and the album is not anything that anyone really cares about. It seems to be just very track focused, super temporal, and. Um, a vast and welcome. I'd put that those under kind of deep listening albums, right? And uh, you need to sit down, proper soak them in, and to get the most out of them. That's like kind of the antithesis of uh, the, the 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 modern music scene, right? That is what I like, yeah. and so that is what I make. And I actually took everything that I've ever self-published off of Spotify. Mm. So there's some stuff of mine on Spotify that other labels have put out and that's fine. Yeah. Um, but I just, I, I take a weird, like sadistic glee that my stuff really doesn't fit in any <laughs> playlist. <laughs> Pro probably fits on, uh, some board game playlists. Uh, a few pals of mine play, uh, board games and they have these Spotify playlists for, you know, we're going to play Gloomhaven and they've got these moody music, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> see if if that was if those are the only playlists i ever land on yeah. i am thrilled <laughs> i am thrilled i've always liked the subversive in music i've always liked countercultural music and experimental stuff mm. and i'm perfectly comfortable uh seeing the album now as being a countercultural form um where it's like no 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 i really would prefer if you sat down and just soaked in this mood for 20 to 40 minutes yeah um and uh that's just how i like listening to me listening to music and so of course it influences the music i make and how um and so i'm right there with you i love the ep as a end-to-end -end listening experience the lp as an end-to-end -end listening experience I, I think there is a kind of a growing trend of people wanting that and also wanting the kind of the the tactile element because you're seeing tape coming up quite a lot and cds and seeing cds quite a lot as well but then i think on digital platforms weirdly places like youtube open themselves up to quite long form listening you'll go in there and be like oh, three hours of rainforest sound and stuff like that and i've, I've often thought oh, i wonder if that'll move its way into more musical stuff instead of lo-fi chill study music it's three hours of just intricate polymetric music that you can listen to while studying <laughs> that exists that exists one of my favorite uh labels right now is a label called cryo chamber and their specialty is dark ambient music yeah i've seen that. and so they they have these amazing playlists that are just superb very well curated the music's phenomenal but they're literally called like three hours of music to read ancient tomes and summon cthulhu to you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh the, the guy who runs the label he does all the mastering and he does all the album artwork himself oh, cool. and so he has like a, a cyberpunk uh themed dark ambient 
uh, stream that's I I think it's just a live stream that runs all the time. But the image is like someone, some cyberpunk character like on a tram and you see like this city going by in the background it's like i could listen to that all day that's my lo-fi girl i'm curious to see how this is all going to develop in the mid 2000s new technologies came came about and they're like hey this is now how we're going to experience this thing but that's not necessarily the best way to experience the thing so i think given enough time the needle might recalibrate itself, you know, and, and folks might think, actually, you know what, this is actually a, a preferable way of, like, consuming music. And totally. I wonder if it will also feed its way into hardware where, you know, how in, in the music world we're getting, I don't know, stuff like that Chompy, which is like a SV1 kind of very simple sampler keyboard thing. Maybe there's like a, hey, we're releasing this basically a mini disc player you know or something or, or or an old ipod type listening device i don't know uh i say bring it man that would be that would be amazing like i'm one of those people where like when i have to upgrade my phone i always choose the phone with the highest uh storage capacity and i fill it every time so like for me actually having a phone and a freaking ipod is a good solution because yeah, i don't right, right. i need i need the space i can't carry enough music around with me uh in a portable way to to satisfy me i just can't and it and the, like music is just so broad like you you were talking we we're talking about like musical storytelling there was a project i did with um rob bridget who used to work at um in montreal he was the audio director of shadow with the tomb raider oh um, yeah I forget which studio that was but he, he works at uh, playstation now we did this project where like the packaging was critical to understanding the music because it was this experimental thing where there's this place called the Ambiguity Research Institute. So the narrative goes, shortwave operators were hearing broadcast over shortwave. And they're just inexplicable, very strange, kind of weird, eerie. Um, and we don't tell you what it is. But there's a companion website with oh, cool. a whole bunch yes. of, of cues in HTML comments in the code. Mm. Um, and like alt tags for images. There's like clues in there. Um and then if you got the uh, if you bought the album on Bandcamp and you either you got it physically or you got the PDF download, there was like more artifacts in there to kind of give you a, more clues as to like what the world of the Am Ambiguity Research Institute is. And so that really reminded me of the power of just like aggregate gestalt storytelling hmm. in terms of looking at the album as an entire package that includes graphic design it includes motion design and filmmaking because we did all these um promo videos for it um that were kind of in world uh and so for me it's just like i i, I would love to puzzle over something that hourly is hard maybe a little bit hard to parse but give me other clues i'm also yeah. reading house of leaves right now <laughs> and that is all about just stories within stories and how the pages are laid out you're right yeah, matter yeah, yeah. in terms of how the story is told yeah. um so i'm a i'm a big fan of that kind of approach that's cool i love i love a concept i'll check that out is it is it still something you can dig into now the uh, institute oh yeah yeah oh, nice. yep uh it's ambiguityresearch.org and okay. it's uh ambity Re ambiguity research institute uh, <clears throat> dot bandcamp dot com so you were saying on super temporal you created some kind of self-generative patches as a starting point and then kind of improvised over the top of it and, and guided it that way. When you're working with hardware like that, I, I've realised that I don't like to multi-track. <laughs> I don't like mm. feeding, you know, 20 audio signals into uh, a door. It's too stressful for me because it's... I mean, I understand the approach because it's like, well, then you're, you're getting the most and you're getting all the data... But I just love working in stereo and I'll record like 20 minutes and then I'll take that 20 minute recording, I'll put it into Ableton or whatever, and then I'll just chop it up and then like layer little bits mm. and elaborate on top of that. For me, I, th I think that captures like the vibe of working with hardware stuff more because you ca you get in that kind of that sound and the, the feel of all these elements just coming together into one channel you know or it's analogous to printing to tape or something like that how do you feel about that kind of stuff for my for my personal practice separate from scoring where yeah, that's yeah. all about like well, you have yeah, to you be have really to, yeah. 
agile in terms of like handling change requests. For sure. But yeah. for my personal practice, I am right there with you. I love the slight imperfections of a live real time performance. I like prioritizing the expression over the editing. Um and kind of like hyper polishing. I just also think to a certain extent, it's it's a little bit about cognitive bandwidth. How much can I really think about in real time as I perform? And the answer is like one thing at a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just have to really focus on one layer at a time and mm -hmm. I just have to be able to switch quickly. But I, I'm right there with you. I'm a big fan of just committing mm -hmm. and just not overthinking and kind of sucking the life out of something through, you know, uh, over egregious editing. Yeah, I think one of the best things I've learned is like to know when something's kind of good enough <laughs> instead of just sweating over it until you tweak it so far that it's just turned into something else. The rubric I use is, is, is what I just laid down, is it resolved? Mm. It's not as perfect. I never ask if it's done. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> I, yeah. I always look like, is it resolved enough that someone who is a listener can engage with it and get something out of it? Then I, I'm i done. <laughs> that's, that's as close to done as I get. It's very, very similar. I think, like, is this thing communicating the thing? Listener feedback is, is super important because, you know, you show something to someone, you know, if the re response is like, yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, it's not communicating the thing. It's not telling its story well enough. I, I do that with sound design all the time. With, with super, super temporal, it's not maybe self-evident, but there are some clues in terms of how some of the tracks are named. Uh, I was really trying to go for things that were, like, languorous and where, as the album name implies kind of the sense of time mm. is strange in terms of something that seems inordinately too long or inordinately too short um and really i don't, I don't know I, I had this whole kind of cosmic weirdness phase that i was going through and really started to think about like wh what are some things that are not like hard science fiction like yeah. or you know hypothesizing about like the future i actually did that on the album called heliopause mm. um that's literally about space um and, which is a different story but this one was really just kind of like imagining cosmic level phenomena is there any um kind of hangovers of a vast unwelcome in this album because there's a lot of metallic pad sounds in there did you reuse any of those techniques from that actually no if there's aesthetic similarities it's it's artist intent not tools okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that's mostly because uh, a vast unwelcome had no modular sense whatsoever hmm. uh, w it had some virtual instruments that mimic the behavior of metallic bodies and membranes and structures hmm. and then the rest of it was actual uh, acoustic recordings hmm. um, and uh, no, no reverb plugins. All like electromechanical reverbs with plates and springs, uh, on on a vast unwelcome. Uh, but with super temporal, that was entirely analog hardware. Right. Okay. Uh, on every single track. So uh, if it's interesting, if you think there's a shared vibe, that's that's cool because they were kind of back to back works that I created. Yeah, yeah. But the tool sets for each were very, very different. Yeah, a vast and welcome is like a real achievement. I kinda wish I'd heard it without knowing the process first. You know what I mean? Oh interesting. Because because I found the process so fascinating and inspiring. Just just you know, you could have just described the album to me and I'd be like, I like it, even without hearing it, you know, <laughs> just because it's such a cool idea. That is that is a classic artist dilemma, by the way. The whole like <laughs> you know, how much context does, should someone have in order to interpret a work. Yeah, right. And, you know, I'm biased because I love that additional context. I do like going yeah. in cold for the first blush, but I always like having that next meaty layer of context. Mm. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe maybe I should, on my Bandcamp page, uh, at the top of each description, I should say, Spoiler! <laughs> and, yeah. and then write the description yeah i feel like the, the process is as much part of it uh, as the uh end result in a way well it's it, it it wound up going in a different direction than when it started like so many right. artistic projects yeah. do um it started with me writing songs literally about winter uh, um, right okay well and that that in fact that's where the the that was the inspiration for the name of the of the album as well from a poem about winter mm -hmm. um and uh and then i just started to realize that the the 
timbres that I'm, I was discovering through write, trying to write songs about how I felt about winter or how winter makes me feel. Mm. Um, they were all metallic and, or the, the ones, the, the timbres that made me feel the most that way. Yeah, interesting. And so at a certain point, I'm just kind of like, okay, well, what if, uh, I think maybe I had two, maybe three tracks completed and then I'm just like, okay, you know what? What if every other piece for this body of work is only made of sounds that either emulate metallic objects or are metallic objects? Mm. And then I got all the songwriting done. And then I looked at my session. I'm like, why am I using uh, reverb plugins? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I have a spring reverb right here. And you know, there was, there was a, that fateful day that I uh, wrote via Slack to the local community of sound designers here uh like does anyone know of a studio that has a working em 14 emt 140 plate reverb right and i expected people to say oh yeah there's that place up in sonoma county i think there's still kind of works and i uh got a message from the skywalker scoring stage saying we have three <laughs> and i'm like oh really <laughs> we should talk and so i wound up reamping the entire album at the skywalker scoring stage through three uh plate reverbs um, using a bunch of different techniques. We ran them in series in parallel. These units only really have a four to five second uh, reverberation maximum. Yeah. So now we're getting like eight to 10 seconds of plate reverb tails. And then feed feedbacking as well. Could you back into it? Were you doing that with it? We didn't actually. No, we didn't. Mm. I, I was trying to be very uh, efficient with studio time. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we didn't get in, into any like feedback patching. Um, but that is a super cool idea for next time though. Uh, cause that would be amazing. At that point you're, you'd written the tracks already. So you, you, you want to add the additional kind of flavor of the, uh, the space yeah. of the, of the plates. It was really tricky then to actually bring that back. Cause all of their plates are stereo plates. Oh, right. Okay. So then, you know, when, when we were running things in parallel, you know, each unit is electromechanical. So each one has a slightly different yeah. timbre and tone. Yeah. But but then taking an entire mix and then trying to mix in six more channels of reverb <laughs> was, was an interesting challenge slash dumb idea somewhere in between the two. Um, but it, it gave me a lot more options and it allowed me to do a lot of lot more things with kind of panning and spatialization of those signals. So, yeah, so it, it was fun. Did you DIY any of these objects like because you use, use gong gong amps and things like that is that right Trans transducer on gongs with something like that is that right uh i did i actually um have a couple of transducers that i that i use from time to time yeah um you know for i think for a year i had a sheet of cold rolled steel on a c stand in my garage and i would bow it i would strike it i would mm. reamp stuff through it and then record it, you know, using the transducers. Um, I have this really interesting device. It's maybe a little bit bigger than a credit card and about six times as thick hmm. called a piezo thing. Uh, and it's made by this uh, guy who operates as Araya Instruments, A-R-A-Y-A. And it's basically a feedback. It's a, it's a, it's a feedback system. So it has a transducer and a piezo. Oh, and there's wow. a knob to feed one back into another. <laughs> and so that's that was used on um, a vast unwelcome in, in one or two places. It sounds great on a drum. You just put it on a drum head and it just un does unholy bizarre things. Because you did a project uh, previously where you built instruments. I can't remember the name of that one. Is that right? Yeah, built... that one was called The Right Side of Mystery. Right Side of Mystery. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. How did you, I mean, I know you've already spoken about this but um, a vast drum welcome and those kind of reamping techniques, it seems like it was maybe born out of your experience with sound recording, potentially. What about the building electroacoustic instruments? Is that just something you've always had a hand in or is it something you developed just for that? Oh, I have, I have no electronic skill. None. Okay. <laughs> um, I've, I've almost cut my fingers off with table saws. I have all the scars to prove right. how unhandy I am. Um, <laughs> but... I think it largely came out of me wanting to make an album that explored uh, extended technique 
on instruments mm. that were not electronic. Mm. Okay. And I've been a lifelong fan of Sonic Youth and Bill Frizzell and uh, folks like that. So I really like kind of unusual guitar technique, unusual string technique. And then I looked at my uh, stringed instruments and thought about what I wanted to do with them. And I'm like, I, no, I, I, I don't want to <laughs> take my really nice Les Paul and just yeah. thrash it constantly with a drumstick. <laughs> uh, so then I started thinking like, well, what's, is this even going to come out right? Can I perform in a way that's interesting with this stuff? I don't know. So like all of a sudden there's this risk calculation. Like yeah. how far am I going to go down this route? And so I started thinking about just building my own instruments. And it's like there's this thing called a diddly bow that is yeah. a plank, two screws, and a piece of wire in between it's them. A string, yeah, right, yeah. And so I was like, okay, cool, I'll do that. Oh, yeah. how am I going to amplify it? Oh, well, I've got all this experience being a field recordist, so I'll use contact microphones, um, you know, make sure they're all impedance match so that I have some low end of some kind. Hmm. Um, and it was really fun. And I started kind of, you know, establishing some techniques. And I was just like, wow, that cost three US dollars to make. Right. <laughs> so the, yeah. there's no risk of failure, basically. Yeah. Other than it sounding like crap, which yeah. a bunch of it did. Yeah, yeah. Um, I tried to make a percussion instrument out of uh, cat food can lids, <laughs> the little you know ripoff lids. Yeah. Let me just tell you, when those things get hot from hammering them or you know using them, they smell like cat food forever. Do not recommend. It. <laughs> yes. um, so uh, and then it just kind of went from there. And next thing you know, I was like building one of these things a week. I built like a a Koto dulcimer thing. And mm. I, you know, I went to salvage yards and I, you know, it was all reclaimed materials was the other theme. It's just like, I don't want to buy stuff and put all my experience experiments back into the waste stream. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. um, it's not just going to be like an Amazon field endeavor. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so that was the origin of it. And just, I don't know, as it came together again, this wasn't a, something that I led with, with any marketing or descriptions or anything, but it was based the, the mental framework for that is what if after our current civilization collapses, how will people make music with the objects of the past, mm. but also misremembering past musical history yeah. and musical traditions so it kind of got this weird like gothic tribal appalachian weird mix thing going on who knew you could build a drum out of some cardboard and packing tape and it right. sounds like an 808 if you build it correctly <laughs> um, one thing that i always hope when people listen to my stuff is like it's a lot of my music is thematically and emotionally dark but i really hope people hear the joy in its making right because yeah, when yeah, i'm doing yeah. this yes it, it is a cathartic emotion sink for me that's a lot of what music does for, for me in my personal practice. But while I'm doing it, there's also just a tremendous amount of just fun and joy and experimentation. Mm. And um, I have no idea if that comes through, but, but it's certainly a, a big part of the music making experience for me, as dark as it gets, is extremely joyful. No, I think it definitely comes through. And uh, one of the things that I find really inspiring about you is that you seem to put yourself into positions that are outside of your comfort zone within the process. It's not like you put yourself necessarily into conceptual uh, discomfort, but it's more, you know, just finding new ways of making, which is really cool because I feel a bit stuck in my ways in, in, in quite a lot of it because, you know, I'm, I'm the synth guy, <laughs> you know, the, the one of many. <laughs> But uh, you, you find angles that inspire you that and, just, and it's not just, you know, everyone's got ideas, but you actually seem to just go for it. On, on that album and A Vast on Welcome, like the, the, the kind of the textural result you get out of it, the depth of the sound um, can only come from that kind of process experimentation. It's really, uh, it's really powerful, I think. Well, thanks. Thanks. I think it's just because like I'm, I'm always asking just like, well, what if? Yeah. Could I? Yeah. Should I? <laughs> I often ask, could I, before I ask, should I? Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I I can guarantee you there's hours and hours and hours of musical experiments that I do that totally don't work, that no one yeah. will ever hear. But, you know, I'm just, I'm obsessed with learning and I just want to know if certain things are possible and see if I can. And uh, my album, um, A Shadow No Light Could Make, was me composing using serialism, 12-tone serialism, like... Mm. 
I don't like a lot of surrealism. I like some of it. So could I use those techniques, compositional techniques, to make something that I feel, you know, is still in line with my aesthetics and can tell a story? Every album, I kind of gleefully hope completely confuses anyone else who's heard any of my other albums. Again, like, I, I make the music I want to hear at the yeah. end of the day. I'm trying to please myself. And so much of this comes from artists I like, you know, pushing themselves. And maybe not every album I like individually, but oh my gosh, do I respect the fact that they, they went there and they gave it a shot. What, in, what inspires you to actually put a thing out there at, at the end of it? In today's world of, you know, fragmented listeners let's say um what, what pushes you to go to that extra step of like formulating that album and and putting that all together that's a very interesting question uh besides maybe an utter lack of shame i would say that you know yes i'm, I'm making music for myself but at the same time i don't feel like it really has much meaning if it's not completed by a listener hmm and it's, it's the listener that imparts the final true layer of meaning um, on it. And I like the idea that pushing an album out officially no longer makes it yours. Mm -hmm. That is now in the hands of others and they're going to make of it what they will. And so I, 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 I like that notion of, you know, it's really the li listener completing the piece. I, mm -hmm. I feel pretty strongly about that. I mean, it's it's so interesting that I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question before. Um, yeah, I, I think it's really about just seeing what other people think. And I think a lot of it also comes from me changing completely what the reasons why I make music over the years. Hmm. You know, uh, when I started in the late 90s, early 2000s, I literally started making music because I was trying to fit in. You know, I was making music for this weird kind of displaced social reason. Yeah. And now that I'm making music to kind of share my perspectives on certain things, like to me, that makes it feel a lot more valid to release it potentially rather than say, here's a thing. Please like me <laughs> talk about something I don't care about at all anymore. What I care about is here's my perspective on a thing. Is this interesting? Mm. And people can say yes or no, and that's that's completely fine. Yeah, I think that's it, it, that seems like a genuine artist's take on on the reasons of of why to art. So, yeah, echoes of David Lynch in there, you know, because of his absolute refusal to explain what any of his stuff is about, because it's 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 the listener, isn't it? It's, it's the audience. They 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 are that that relationship is the thing. What's your percentage split between mastering engineer? Uh, sound designer, sound recordist, video game, head of department. <laughs> you seem to cover a lot of bases. Um, it very, it's, it's always in flux. Yeah. It's always in flux. I, I, I spent about six years being 75% full-time mastering engineer and 25% sound design mm. um, for games and, and some short films. Mm. And uh, that did a pretty hard flip two years ago Okay. where now I'm 80% game audio and probably 10% mastering. Was that a move that you engineered or was that just through opportunity? Through opportunity, largely. Um, yeah. You know, but like I said, I always like to be learning and constant self-improvement. And this is another reason why I just feel very passionate about just sharing my output with whoever happens to listen mm. because I just, the more I shared my progress, the more people were like, Oh wait, Nathan could actually totally fit on our team yeah. to do yeah. this wise and unreal project. And um, so the, the move towards full, uh, basically full-time game audio uh, has only been in the last couple of years, but it's been wonderful. Like I've spent my whole career working in and around software and interactive experiences. So I'm actually much more conversant with the workflow of, making a piece of software than I am a film. Right. But, you know, it it comes and goes because projects start and stop or get canceled or whatever. So, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. there's always this flow. But that's also why music and releasing commercial sound effects libraries are also 
in the mix there because that yeah. can help kind of fill those gaps and frankly fulfill different kinds of creative fulfillment. Um, when I'm when I'm feeling like the music well is kind of dry, yeah, you know, I'll switch to reading and film or gaming, and I will like I'll switch from out output to input. Mm -hmm. But I can just be like, I don't have anything to say musically. Let's let's make a bunch of sound effects, and that can be just as fun and just as creatively rewarding, just in a different way. For sure, yeah, yeah. For me, like splitting my video game work with my creative work. Well, my creative, my personal work. It, I, I kind of have to create a, a large amount of separation. My process is just one hundred percent different to when I just mm. do my own personal work. You, you seem like a very creatively energized person. You got a lot of creative energy in you to push you forward into doing a bunch of various different projects, probably simultaneously as well, right? Um, and for me, I think it's like you've you've got these different tanks, creative tanks that you're just filling up, right? And uh, for mm -hmm. me, the, the 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 day job stuff is like it's it's so demanding of time and kind of mental energy and all this sort of stuff. Like I couldn't possibly in my downtime go, oh, I'm going to do a, a redesign of a you know this sequence right. in a game. Do you know what I mean? It's just I just could not totally. do that. Yeah. I mean, I was I was an art major in university, and one of the thing, one of the life lessons I took from that was always have two canvases going. You have this one creative problem that in your you just grind down on it, and you're frustrated. Rather than just walk away and not be productive, mm. take the canvas, turn it against the wall so you're not looking at it. Yeah. Flip the other one around yeah. and work on this other thing. But I, I I really relate to what you're talking about, though. Like if I'm spinning up two different projects at the same time, they have to be really different from one another. Mm. The contexts have to be very different. Like yeah. game audio and music works great. Mastering and making sound effects works great. Uh, doing game, I'm just, I'm right there with you. Doing game audio professionally and then doing a game audio side gig, <laughs> that's a grind. And that yeah. can be, that can be very, very draining. Yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing how you can be um, really fatigued by some work that you're doing but then you work in this totally separate thing it's like, where's all this energy come from what excites you about the games industry right now from an audio perspective honestly these maybe very 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 beginnings of very high quality games that aren't that long <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> now i might be speaking more as a player on that yeah. one than a than an audio person <clears throat> but um did you play like, uh, uh, Cocoon or Jusant last year? They were oh, like three hours. Jusant's on my list. Jusant's great. Jusant's on it. my list. Yeah. But um, yeah, Cocoon, talk about a synthesized sound masterpiece. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, amazing. Wow, even the Foley's synthetic, like oh, that game sounds so good. And uh, that whole team just did an amazing job. And it's. I found it extra transport transporting the fact it was all pure synth because it just had this uncanniness about it so you did feel like it was a, mm. a very unearthly place there's there's no like uh familiar handles to grab onto yes in terms of yeah. like what should things sound like is this yeah. a bird analog or an insect analog and just like having it be entirely its own thing i think that's maybe that's a little bit of that initial kind of play dead dna too of just mm. kind of like games that are that are so thoroughly postmodern. Yeah, yeah, that for there's sure. Yeah. Really, very little kind of previous art to reference. Well, I mean, what about you? What's what's exciting you about um, the state of game audio and where that's going? We've just moved to Unreal Engine Five uh, on a couple of projects, and uh, digging into the whole meta sounds thing. And I, I, I just think there's probably quite a lot of potential in having this instead of having you know you. you your audio middleware separate from the game engine, having everything entirely connected and, and built in together, I think could give birth to a um, much deeper and potentially more meaningful non-linearity or interaction in the mm. sound. But yeah, I'm also quite excited about... Um, so it used to be that uh, games would emulate film. So let's record the orchestra let's get those Hollywood sound effects in there. That was that was a kind of the objective. I, f I think that games kind of took that sound to its extremes to the point now where Hollywood is now trying to make things sound like video games, especially in, in trailers and that sort of stuff. What's emerging out the other side of that is that there's loads of games out there that have got their own very, very unique 
voice. Like Cocoon's a good example. Um, always used to reference a, a little platformer game called Goner. Like it just sounds like nothing else. It's almost like it's a middle finger to that whole Hollywood sound kind of thing. So I think yeah. creatively um, games are going to move into a space where it's encouraged to innovate in terms of your creative sound design as, as much as uh, your, your kind of technical. It's just a maturity of the genre, I think, of the industry. I totally agree. And I, I think that it's it's... It was it was a useful crutch for a while to have games kind of try to be like interactive cinema. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. But that's not the only way that interactive experiences need to be or can be um, or should be. So I, I think I, I agree seeing more more diversity. And I think the other thing I'm excited about is I would love to see more use of game tools to make other media besides games. Mm. Uh, just like how now Unreal in terms of real time visuals is a absolutely key critical component to how a bunch of uh genre fiction television shows are made right or yeah, streaming yeah, shows yeah. are made yeah and so i've i have lots of ideas about like an album made entirely in wise and mm. that's i wouldn't be the first person to do that mm, but yeah. um you know now that we've got things like meta sounds and stuff like that um you know the idea of could a long form listening experience be influenced by something other than someone just sitting there and listening on headphones? You know, is it, yeah, you know, totally. Could yeah. it be driven, driven by their accelerometer or the, you know, the album's different every time based on what the weather is, where the mm. listener is, you know, there's so many opportunities for, for really uh, interesting uh, expressions like that. It's interesting how, um, listening to music in games kind of not as a soundtrack. What would you, what would you describe that kind of, diegetically like listen to music in a game environment uh with the intention mm. of listening to music as opposed to it being a background mm. or a thing that hasn't really found its place into many the only things I'm, that's come to mind is like those those fortnight um performances that they do and and maybe some stuff in second life and things like that but i was i got a vr headset um a while ago and i i jumped into that um What's it called? That 3D chat thing, chat, chat 3D, chat room. Oh, 3D uh, VR is, chat. VR chat, yeah, and yeah. absolutely insane uh, ex experience there. I, like, I, I spent about four hours on it, and now I just I haven't gone back to it. <laughs> but it it was really um, it was really inspiring though because it's it's crazy. It's like a uh, it's like Mad Max or something. You've got like screaming kids and anime stuff happening in one corner, and then you've got art installations in another little pocket of space where people are just making crazy trippy visuals and stuff like that or you've just got these kind of these little spaces where they're just designed to put you in a frame of mind and a mood and a, and, a, and a sense of focus and i think it's so cool but also audio music is it's just not there and i, I wonder if it's a, a kind of a tooling thing you know maybe mm -hmm. you know as you say, maybe if if the tools move to a certain space, then artists like musicians, composers, producers, whatever, might be like, oh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to write this thing, and then that is compatible with these other elements as well. You know, um, that could be right. an interesting future. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 got to be a better way to do that than building a bunch of 3D assets and making like an in-game. You can tell I'm giving a very specific example here. Uh, making an uh, a uh, like 90 meter long in-game physical modular synth. <laughs> like, yes, like, yeah, like, right, yeah. <laughs> it's neat that that was done, yeah, but yeah. is that really how I want to make music? But like, like so many new <clears throat> uh, or emerging kind of hybrid art forms, you have to go through this kind of like skeuomorphic valley of like, oh yeah, it still has to have a knob, and now the knob is in 3D. And your avatar goes and turns the knob. Mm. So it's like, we have to work our way through that a little bit, I think, before that stuff becomes really creatively compelling. Yeah. But we'll get there. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, mate. I think that was a cool chat. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for um, for reaching out. I'm so glad we had we had a chance to do this. Thanks for some of these questions. Like the, A lot of this stuff is stuff people have never asked me to, to think about or, or, or talk about. So that was, okay, that was a good nice. challenge. Okay, right, I'm glad. <laughs> Cool. All right, then. Well, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, I'm sure we'll speak soon. Absolutely. 
thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that chat. I've walked away with a bit of an urge to start getting my hands dirty and actually work with more physical sound objects. If you want to follow Nathan's journey, check out his Bandcamp, which is just nathanmoody.bandcamp.com. I also recommend following his Instagram if you're on there. It's full of inspiring little snippets of work. Is this a podcast now? I don't know yet. I'm going to do a few more chats with folk before I decide if this is something I want to continue with. But check out the playlist link below if you want to follow as more chats are uploaded. Uh, But yeah, thanks again for listening. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye.